huge moment. You know, two people in the audience and one falls asleep. <laughs> Just, uh, just after lunch, it's warm. So I'm going to give you all, there you are, you can perhaps, perhaps you could take one down past one, and so you can all have a bookmark by way of a, um, by way of a prize. Thank you. Um, now, what I really enjoyed about yesterday, well I didn't manage to hear quite all of it because I had to catch a train, and today, is just that this thing called oral history and the way that all these things that we've talked about have taken us into so many different worlds. So geographic ones and cultural ones um, and kind of societal and structural ones. So now I'm going to take you off to yet another one, which is the 2,000 kilometres of what is basically a man-made bridge. <laughs> That's the canals. They were the motorways of the 18th century, and they, it's extraordinary. There's this incredible heritage and stories and richness of history around the canals. But when you get down to it, they're a muddy ditch. That is my boat. It's my home, and uh, where I work from to uh, share the running of alarm productions with Heather Wasted. Um, Slight mistake in, in how I framed my abstracts in that Heather was, it was always going to be me, I'm afraid. Heather was always going to be somewhere else with her. But you will be hearing her. She's going to join us uh, in, a, in a piece from YouTube. And this is at the highest point on the Birmingham Canals, should you be interested. And we're going to go on to... This is who we are. I suppose our work is probably best described as documentary. We use oral history, we use archive material, letters, uh, newspapers, books. You're going to see and hear something from some of the books written by women about the war. Um, conversations, interviews, all sorts. I somewhat specialise in telling stories, so you're going to hear from a fictional character soon. Heather is a poet and a songwriter. That's one of my favourites, it's about a brothel. And that box is my set, which usually goes everywhere with me, but I could not manage it on a train to Greenwich. Over, we, we met on Twitter and discovered we both done works about this group of women who were known as the Idle Women. Has anybody heard of them? No. Okay. They were, it's fine, very satisfying actually. Just give you a hat, why would I be here? Um, yeah, they were, they were the land girls of the waterways. There weren't a huge number of them, about a hundred started, I think 44, 45 survived for any length of time. And after the war, they got this nickname, Idle Women. And that was because of their badge. Uh, Inland Waterways, it's a national service badge. And uh, it was one of the women called Susan Wolfitt who was writing a book and wanted a title for it. She was a bit older than the others, she had a family, and her daughter suggested Idle Women. And it was really interesting listening to Pamela talking about myths because there are, there are myths about this nickname. You will still, even after, I don't know how many hundreds of shows Heather and I have done to dispel it, you will still hear people say, oh, it's what the boatmen called the women. Most of the boatmen never went to school to read or write. They didn't do, they didn't do names based on words. Um, it was entirely after the war. So the show comprises a solo play, mine, Isabel's War, which tells the story of a young middle class woman, because they were mostly middle class, oddly, um, who took on this work. And it uses the device that she's fictional, but everything that happens to her happened to somebody. Just not necessarily the same person or in that order. Heather's work, uh, that you're going to hear in just a moment, um, Idle Women and Judy's, draws, is a mix of oral history and I apologise to parents and poetry. 
<laughs> she was poet laureate from Worcestershire. So we've got two poets, actually, but they're very good, so it'll be fine. So, um, in a moment, you're going, to, um, you're going to hear from Isabel. Obviously, about turning into Isabel now. Um, we're going to meet her on her second day on the water. And uh, it's all rather new to her. And uh, she's going to be about it to encounter her first lock. But while she's thinking about it, uh, we'll hear from Heather. Her piece is called Idle Women and Judies. So it draws on the memories of women who worked um, on the Grand Union, but also some who worked up on the Leeds and Liverpool. And it uses, say, all histories, documentary sources, um, and go. Oh, you get pictures. I was 16 when the war started, so I did a secretarial course, and then I worked for a branch of the war office in just outside Oxford, it was MI5. It sounds rather glamorous and romantic, and it was incredibly boring. And they said in the Manchester Evening News that they wanted girls to go to learn how to be working on the Bahamas, on the Leeds and the Liverpool Canal. Oh, that's right for me, that is, that's just the job. Splashed across the evening news, idle boats in need of crews. So young girls, greenhorns, applied and went off for interviews. Yeah, my mum and dad weren't a bit pleased about it going on about, but still up so I'm fairly young. Secretaries, hairdressers, artists, ballet dancers, money lenders, service dodgers left their jobs, left their mothers, left their dads and older brothers fighting in the war. Young girls scrounged from their brothers, sailors' jerseys, cricketing whites, shirts and trousers, bib and brace. Stocked up on tins of milk and cocoa, porridge, butter, treacle, coffee. And quantities of tea. Hammered curtains over portholes, nailed old masters to cabin walls. And cross the line and come out of a world, a sort of conventional middle class world, into a completely new world I would never otherwise have known at all. I could splice, I could time up, I could do all sorts of things. Ready to handle lock gate and coal, windlass and tiller, pound their muscles, ready to push, ready to pull, ready to jump, ready to steer, motor or butty boat, run on the top planks, grip the handrail, perch on the gunwale, lift the paddles, drop the paddles, bash their bodies, boat till they dropped. Beds like cupboards, pee in a bucket, fill it and chuck it into the cut, jumping in when the weather's hot, never mind the contents of buckets. Or winter roasting from waist to toe, one hand on the tiller, one hand on a spoon, bending down to stir the stew, aroma rising to rough and red noses. Hours and hours of staring ahead, moving a hand from side to side. Then ropes, rubbing grooves across their shoulders, towing the butty between the locks. Blisters, bruises, broken nails, cuts and calluses, trousers held up with safety pins, never the time to sew or mend. Layers of jersey staying together, one in another for days or weeks. Aching legs from lying on cushions on top of the engine room, walking feet on the side of a tunnel, singing songs, reminders of home. On board Christian soul. So we got to, when we got through to the end, this man was standing there with his dog. He said, I wondered what the dignity said it was, he said. What are you two wenches, he said, doing? Why didn't you put your engine on? I'm not putting the engine on. I said, because I said, there's a fume. I said, um, he said, where's the men? I said, what men? I said, I won't trust the man, I said, to have brought us through that tunnel. Learning the skill of entering locks, swinging the motorboat across, watching the butty boat sliding in, neat as any jigsaw piece. Cargoes of steel or aluminium, Peanuts from Liverpool, wool, sugar, cotton, shoddy, coal from Coventry. Standing in black as it's pouring in, shoveling it, shifting it, coated in dust. Breathing it, finding bits in your boots, grime on pillows, grit in the kettle. Slack to Worcester, Span to Nottingham, grain to the Mersey, flour to Tipton, copper to Birmingham, sauce to Wigan. Nobody wanted cement, which clogged the eyes, lungs, hair and must be kept dry. A difficult job when bilge pumps were clogged up with coal. Cardboard trip cards, battered and muddy, frayed at corners. An air of negligence, 
forgetting what it was like to dance. Luxurious trips to the public baths, sixpence paid for soap and a soak, or ninepence for the biggest and best. The office lavatory was such a treat. Young girls crossed a boundary, entered a world of boaters and bargemen, stevedores, dockers and warehouse men, larking about and telling jokes, every night going back to their houses, back to their wives, talking of gypsies, didn't get on with the silent, reticent, working families on the move, babies chained to chimney stacks. For some, the work never stopped, incessant, continuing through the night, through the blackout, headlights shaded, wore a distant noise in their ears. Doodle books, aiming for the docks, looked so pretty, like fireworks, with flames coming out of their tails, and you'd listen. Engine, like a lawnmower, and when it stopped, you held your breath, because when it stopped, it dropped. A bomb on the basin would sink the lot, so load up quickly and hurry away, don't stop to sheet up. Tarpaulins can wait till we're outside and safe. They could spill us, they could time us, they could do all sorts of things. After a life of letters waiting at toll office, library books borrowed and left at the post office, rain leaking in and soaking bedding, feet vibrating to throb with the engine, washing their smalls in the coat. When the war ended, Idle women were no longer needed, and idle boats were handed over, spotless and beautiful, engines perfect, brasses polished, cleaner than ever they'd been before. I could splice, I could die not, to I could do all sorts of things. I'm not very good at locks yet. Pat was supposed to be helping me. Only yesterday she mistook some green algae for solid land. Went straight through it. Came up covered in the most disgusting green slime. She was laughing. Thought it was hilarious. I thought I was going to be sick. Um, now, um, our boats are coming from down there and the lock's full, so I need to empty it. I'm going to hang around for half hour while you ever get to me. You've got another thing coming. I'm just learning. Everyone has to learn. Even you had to learn sometime. Too bloody long ago to remember. Now get out of the way and stay out of the way. friends with them and they help her out of many a small crisis. We toured that show, I don't remember what time or two. Oh look, a national service badge. It's a replica. 
Heather, um, yes, actually the film, you would have seen Heather wearing, we, we own a real one. She's, she's a very precious, oops, thing. Hmm. Never change on stage, it's not a good thing. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so we, took, we followed the routes that uh, the, the women worked from London up to Birmingham, on to Coventry, back to London, uh, from Leeds across to Liverpool, from Worcester up to Tipton and on to Cannock. And when we were in Tipton, we uh, collaborated with the Tipton Civic Society and we held a reminiscence event because anybody knows Tipton and the Black Country, it's called the Venice of, of the Midlands. And I can't remember how many miles there used to be, some were closed, but it is literally canals thread through it. There's almost nobody who grew up in Tipton who doesn't have stories about the canal. So we, uh, on to the next one, we ran a reminiscence group. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you some clips, a few minutes of clips, which is um, the top right hand corner. Um, and then um, we worked with Emma Pursehouse, who is the currently Wolverhampton Poet Laureate. She has recently won third prize in the National Poetry Competition and is uh, an extraordinarily talented um, poet. She does wonderful black country stuff. So we're going to listen to a little bit of some of the clips that contributed and then to her poem, The Two Sides of the Cup. Feeling very brief. Well, first of all, I live by the waterways at number 10, Lower Green. Uh, I long drunk all of this pop or beer, and he drank that much in the canal. <laughs> and we had a very hard winter, a very hard winter. So what happened? He was under the ice, and he was missing for six or seven weeks. So even more oh. than that, they couldn't find him anywhere. So when the ice boat came along to shake, uh, the boat shaped the ice, he was there. The big Ivan, that little boy, he was two and a half going on three. He got out. What did he do? He fell in the canal and he got drowned. This bridge over here by the fountain, um, there was a lady there and there was a dog and he kept barking all night long and he was quite a dog. What happened? She took her own life. And the sad part about it, there was a boat got pulled up. This lady had a baby. They didn't want the baby. They threw it overboard and they moved off. And in Tipton Cemetery, there is a little grave with the unknown child. And I'm wondering whether that is the baby. Cross it over at night and you could hear this noise. Chum, 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 chum. Hello, Joe, you've got a load of lady. Where are you going? You know, and you can hear them. I'm continuing that gentleman talking about um, the Sunday school treat when they yeah. hired a canal boat. Yeah. The women used to get to work and scrub that boat out inside out. And then when it was dry, they'd line it with all newspapers and they'd carry all the benches and forms out of the chapel into the boat. On the old rock canal, there was another little bridge there that we used to take a shallow bank. It was only a, a little bank. And we used to take the next over there and get into the, the canal side and fish for Jack Dallas. What's that? So sticklebacks? Yeah. Yeah. And then there was a big thing. How about how many romances are looking at? Anybody else? Like romantic walks on the canal. I took Keith once to show you where I used to call it on the old fashioned I think there was a lot of activity under the canal beaches in those days.
So my mother had not died, and my father was well into canals, and he, he was always connected with them. And he, I thought, if he got a boat to look after, he said, keep him busy. And uh, he said, oh, I know somebody, and it was Malcolm Bray who spoke to me. And uh, he actually took me to my wedding on, on the boat, uh, because the church was by the, by the canal as well. <laughs> That's, that's a clue for some of the stories. Um, there were an awful lot of stories about people dying. And that was, that was a definite thread through it. And yeah, so we worked with Emma, and this is her poem. Two sides of the court, when my pleasant face is showed, don't say as how you ain't been told, stay off the shiny bits and keep out the off road. Some days it's all salt of the earth and butter wouldn't melt and chocolate crumb smiles and on those days when the sun shines I'm gin clear. On coots and moor ends, on irises and lilies, the suck of the carp, the plash of the ledger, the whir of the line. High about as laughter, a million lot miles from disaster. I'm all about benevolence, hiding my malevolence. But don't say as how you ain't been told to stay off the shiny bits and keep out the osh road. Some days I am a Sunday school treat on dangled feet, cool in toes, Jack Bannock's caught in a net, and then it's so easy to forget the dark side. On good days I'm all about the romance, the damselfly dance, and I give you courting couples necking on the towpath, out for a giggle, out for a laugh, chapping and wenching. And some days I'm happy to greet you with a smile for a while, it's all life so sweet, and it's 50 tons of scaff delivered safely to New Old Street. And I'm running like clockwork, steer to the bread, steer to the cheese. And on days like these, I'm a calm lunch break. A walk, trip, a jog, slip, a bite, bite, skip, an ice slide, crack, a breeze in the willow trees, timber, crash, shh. It's all about benevolence, hiding the malevolence. Don't say as how you have been told to stay off my shiny bits and keep out the osh road. Because then there are those other days, those cross cratch, snide hatch, slash down, stair rod, cat and dog, shuddling sack, black as slack, sort of days when I'm heart stopping cold and I'm every poor soul whose life I've taken. From the navvies to the babbies, I'm every wretch that's ever drank it on a stretch or dropped into a lock. And on those days, the opposite is true. I'm all about malevolence and hiding the benevolence. So don't say as how you ain't been told to stay off the shiny bits and keep out the osh road. On those days, I'm cries for help. I'm the unheard lad from Lower Green who liked his pop. Glug, glug, slosh. I'm the yelp of a drowning whelp. I'm the tears of a woman who took her own life. I'm the toddler overboard, boat disappearing in the foggy night. One less hungry mouth to feed. I'm the Braidsbridge boatman's hook, pulling bodies from the court. On those days, I'm fights over stolen water. I'm not better than I ought to be. I'm go on, I dare you, half a crown in the hand to egg you on, oops, footy gone. On those days, I'm watching you catch your chin, bash your teeth, and I'm there at your side, whispering, you're my going in. And then it's easy to forget the lighter side. Because on those days, I'm all about malevolence, hiding my benevolence. So even when my pleasant face is showed, don't say as how you ain't been told, to stay off the shiny bits and keep out the osh road. No. Don't say as how you ain't been told to stay off my shiny bits and keep out the osh road. Anyone like to guess what the shiny bits are? It's a phrase amongst boaters when you go back from the pub to, uh, um, yeah, basically, don't fall in. We then went on, that set us thinking about what to, to do next, because having looked at the women during the war, we started looking forward from that, and uh, don't read that just yet, um, <clears throat> and decided that, uh, we started to looking at the period just after the war. And I <coughs> have lived on a boat for 23 years now. Heather has never lived on a boat, but her family were very involved in the, uh, the, the campaigning and restoration around particularly the Staffordshire Worcester Canal and the Dudley Tunnel. And if you've never been to the Dudley Tunnels, go and, and have a trip into the tunnels. They are 
magical. Uh, and quite soon you'll be able to hear some of the stories that we recorded about them in them. And so we started an oral history project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and created this project called I Did Canals. And I Did Canals was a, a 70s slogan, as in, you know, we did canals. Uh, as one of our contributors said, um, that when it was the 60s, everyone was protesting about something. We were just putting our protesting into action as they dug out the Dudley Tunnel. So from it, we created a book. We've just created a show, which we're going to start touring um, from London uh, at the beginning of May, um, from the, the London Canal Festival. And because this, piece, this session was called a workshop, Pam was very keen that you actually got something to do. Uh, and I didn't warn you at the beginning. So I'm going to get you to do something. So we can put this up now. And um, so I'm going to use one. We're going to listen to, this is Jenny Hatton. She's lived on a boat for many years. Um, and uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to get you to play it. That is part of the text. And are you all familiar with a haiku? So pencil in hand or your um, phone or whatever suits you or just sit and have a rest, whatever suits you. So we're going to play you, Jenny. You'll have that up in front of you. I'm just going to give you five minutes to have a look go and uh, create something that you feel captures the sense of what you've heard. When I first started boating in 1977, we would literally have to pull the rubbish out of the way to get through some of the loops, <coughs> definitely. Main line was always okay. Um, when we had outboard motors, I had lost count of the number of shear pins we got broken because we got something around the prop. Uh, it was, if you managed to go a couple of miles without breaking shear pin, you were doing well. And just for the record, the shear pin is a protective... It's the failsafe, it's the fuse, yeah, yes. yeah. So something rather than wrecking your engine, shear pin goes. Shear pin goes, and you know you've got something around the prop. Um, in fact, the first time I went out with Graham on his boat, we were... That's the shed. The shed, yeah. We were, um, it was March, it was snowing. The shear pin went. I had to use my tights to strain the oil to get all the bits of swarf out because he'd forgotten to bring any more oil with him and we needed it to repack the bottom end of the leg when he'd replaced the shear pin. So my first... Um, my first introduction to boating was freezing cold, snowing on the towpath in Edgebuster, draining gear oil <laughs> through my eye. Thanks for that. <laughs> and I still came back for more. I must have been mad. And so 40 years later, you're still Yeah, married. absolutely. <laughs> yes, indeed.
for you in another minute. Okay, well, bear in mind there is Prosecco on the horizon, so I won't um, be ashamed to come between you and it. Um, anybody like to share what they've written? And if you're going to share it, I think it would be quite nice to come here because then it'll be on the camera and be part of the, the whole record. I'll do it. Thank you. I've never done it before, so it's silly. That's what it's for. I'm going to go. J pins bust, it's cold. Graham, no use, so tights, I must use, that works. Go on, go to A loose count of sheer pins, strain oil through tights and snow, so all bits of swarf out. All bits of swarf out. Yes, that's all the muck in the air. This is very impressive. Something round the prop, tangled, breaking the shear pin, still uncaught, years on. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> I, mis I misunderstood the task. Well, don't worry. It doesn't really, um, it, it, there was nothing um, firm about it. Slow is good on boats. Sliding quietly forward now. Listen. Birds, breeze, flow. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. <laughs> That's captured a lot of what appealed to people when they, um, when they got involved in boating. Yes, you're all enthusiastic, I'll let some of yours too. <laughs> Mine is not what you asked for. Well, it's not. <laughs> I keep saying it. It was, a, it was a suggestion. Mucky, oily tights, freezing, snowy nights. Graham was his name and boating was his game. Birmingham muck, pins getting stuck. Didn't put me off though. Still loving life on the barge, me and Graham giving it large. <laughs> <laughs> They've lived on a boat for a lot, not initially, but for a lot of it. They, uh, they, they were moored in um, the centre of Birmingham, working on Brummagen boats, and then down in Gas Street, when it was still a whole fenced off area, uh, near what is now the mailbox. And uh, she tells a wonderful story about waking up one night thinking the boat, realising the boat was moving. And somehow three very drunk young men had managed to get over the fence, get onto their boat, had untied it. <laughs> But, I know we were in the 90s, it had a shoreline attached. So they were trying to pull this boat out while it was still connected to the national grid. And when um, Jenny appeared semi-naked and shrieked at them, I mean, you can hear Jenny, she, there was no, no holding back. Um, she said it was amazing, somehow they got over the fence. She doesn't know how they managed it, because it was about six foot high. But yeah, yeah they're still on a boat, and uh, now in a lovely spot called Horn Basin. Anybody else? Like to chip one in? I'm sure there's one in there. <laughs> I don't want to read mine, it's not good enough. There's honestly, there's no, there's no but. No, there's really no <laughs> Okay. Right, in that case, we'll just we'll, we'll kill the slide, and then what I'm going to just finish with nice. is. Um, for ID canals, we use a mixture of, we use some verbatim pieces. The only shift there is to bring them into the present tense because the spine of the show is a, a real trip made by Heather's family in 1970 from a spot called Bumble Hole uh, down through Starbridge down to Stour Port. And it was, it was for a rally. So we use that journey and her mother's boat log as, as the spine of it, but to it we've attached um, verbatim pieces from the, um, the recording. So I'm just going to do two, which are two of mine from early on, and they both relate to uh, an activity, a uh, big activity in the 60s and 70s and 80s, which was, and they still go on, work parties. 
getting out there to, to get things cleared out. And um, you're going to hear from two Margarets, Margaret Clark and Margaret Gibson, um, who both took part in different ways. I've come to dig. i come on my own, parked up and said, uh, what do you want me to do? And they said, uh, well, we've got some sickles and sides and we want the vegetation clearing. All right, that's me. I'll clear some vegetation. So they gave me this sickle and you'd have had a job to cut soft butter with it. Have you got a sharpening stone, I said. So they found me one and I started sharpening it and I just got it nice. And somebody came up and said, oh, a sharp sickle. I walked off with it. <laughs> Left me their blunt one. If anything, it was worse than the one I'd started with. So I set two, and I got that one nice and sharp. And I thought, right, that's me. Now I'm going to cut some vegetation. Someone else walked up and said, oh, you the woman sharpening the sickles. Walked off with it. I haven't dug a single thing. I haven't cut a single blade of grass. But I'm now sharpened some sickles. <laughs> Disaster. To get more publicity for the working party, somebody decided to invite all the locals to bring a friend. Bad, bad move. They've all turned up. <laughs> the queue goes all the way around the village hall and, and out the door. I think we've counted about 80. I mean, Claire and I are used to these things. We were a bit wary, thought we'd done enough mince and mash for about 60. We were told to cater for 30 to 35. Oh, thank goodness for the kind lady from the farm raiding our deep freeze. At least we've got fish finger sandwiches. <laughs> and just to round off completely, I'm going to tell you the end of Margaret's digging story. You always have trouble finding this. I had to do that book. This isn't necessarily for basin, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, this took place at Park Head, at one end of Dudley Tunnel. It was a big event. Uh, there were hundreds of people there working, and a number of dignitaries, mayors, local mayors, had been brought through the tunnel to Park Head, which meant their chauffeurs and their nice cars were at the other end in Dudley. And uh, so towards the end of the day, somebody said, uh, anyone got a car? And Margaret said, well, yeah, yeah, I've got mine, but it's, um, it's only a mini. And they said, oh, that's all right. One of the mayors wants a lift back to his car. She said, well, it's only a mini, but it's OK, I'll take it. So the mayor appeared and said, um, ah, uh, can, I, can I bring my friend, one of the other mayors? <laughs> she said, it's only a mini. She ended up with four West Midlands mayors <laughs> stuffed into her mini. She put the three, what she decided were the three smallest in the back and, and one in the front. And she said the best bit was when they got back to the, to the Dudley end and it was the look on the uh, face of all their chauffeurs <laughs> with their polished cast. <laughs> Thank you very much.